I do want to acknowledge my uh, collaborator, Simi Mazir and, and John Doris, and this has truly been a collaborative project. In fact, last time we shared the presentations, we were thinking about that today, but in the end, um, I'm going to present one part. There's more parts of the project I'm not going to talk about today. That's why you see this a little bit in smaller font, but we're going to focus on on the stability, um, because I know many of you will have to catch planes. So in case you can't stay through the, all the way through the talk, I'll give you the answer, the take-home message right away. The answer is 0.40. The question, though, if you want to have that, <laughs> I'll t tell you later. OK. Um, I don't really have to, to dedicate too much time to the long history of the person to situation debate. It's been going on for, for, for 80 years. There was a, a special issue dedicated to it at age 40 in 2009. Um, by some accounts, uh, you could say, well, it started in 1928 when Hartshorn and May conducted their first studies, the behavioral studies on honesty in children, where they gave ch children several tasks, among them a task where they had to take a test. And then um, unbeknownst to the children, they took it out, they photocopied it, gave it back to them, and children had an opportunity to self-score the test. And so you had a, a gold standard of, of whether the children was, were cheating or not. And they found very little consistency. And there were many, many studies. and. Um, many of the people who have been working on this are in the room, um, and so we, we really have a lot of expertise here that is specifically in the context of the person situation debate. Um, nevertheless, I think it's fair to say, well, the fact that we have um, this, this conference and this symposium is that we still don't know some of the basic issues around the psychometric properties of moral virtual behaviors, particularly from an observational standpoint. So when we see um, most of the research on the person situation debate is conducted in the context of um, global personality questionnaires, increasingly also um, in the context of experience sampling. But some of the very original research started with an observational, from an observational standpoint. And, and so what um, I want to do, or we, what we wanted to do in the project, is to, to shed some light on that from the perspective of naturalistic observation. So the purpose of the project was to shed new light on questions around the existence of moral character by examining the convergence among behavioral self-report and informal report measures of moral character. Um, Zemin Vazir presented around that last time a little bit, and that's, um, um, she's, she's working on that, has, has several studies going on. And second, testing the stability, variability, and changeability of virtuous daily behavior relative to non-virtuous, um, neutral, and negative daily behavior using a novel naturalistic observation sampling method. So we really wanted to, to answer the question from the perspective of what's going on in people's daily life from an observational point of view. And the tool that we use for that is um, the tool that, that um, I've been developing and maintaining for the last, well, it's a number of years by now already, an electronically activated recorder. The idea behind the electronically activated recorder is very, very easy. It's meant to be an acoustic observation sampling tool. So participants in, our, in, in those studies they come to the lab, they get a little tape recorder. Um, originally, it was um, an analog tape recorder with analog tapes that you had to flip after one day. Then we got much more fancy, and we had these digital Sony recorders with, I think it was a four kilobyte uh, memory stick that we were really happy about. And we had digital recordings, timestamp recordings. Then we used um, pocket PCs. And recently, we started um, using the eye ear um, that you can download fr freely from on the iTunes platform, so we use um, PDAs, we use the iPod Touch. Um, so this is an example here. Um, the sampling pa patterns vary slightly, but for, for the data that we report here, we had 50 seconds every um, nine minutes, so we record about 10% of the day, um, which means 90% of the day is private in the first place. There's no intrusion to privacy. Um, we only sample very brief snippets um, periodically along the way of participants' natural day. So when the participants come back, give us the, the, um, the sound files, what we get is an acoustic log of a person's day as it naturally unfolds. And, well, that's when the work starts for us, so we need to convert those sound files into, um, into numbers, so we, we start coding behaviors. Um, what we obtain is, well, this acoustic log of a person's day, and we obtain essentially a, about 100 sound bytes per person per day of recording. And to give you a sense of what is captured when, when we send the ear out to people's daily lives, I brought um, a sound file of um, daily life in, well, in this particular case, Austin, Texas. <laughs> Where are we at? Where are we going? Uh, I live on Fruit Street. I live on 500 miles. I live on 500 miles. 
So what you see is that there's a lot of, lot of um, social information contained in the sound files. This is actually this is not, not 50 seconds. This is actually not even 30 seconds. These were just like 10 or 12 seconds cut, so cut for presentational purposes. But you already hear the person is not alone. There's somebody else there. The person is outside. There's a car in the background. The person is singing. And, and most would probably agree in a pretty good mood. So it's a lot of psychologically relevant information contained. The question, though, is so do we really capture daily life as it is in, in all its shades? And, and how about those situations that are um, uh, a little more emotionally taxing? So here's an, an example of emotional life as captured by the ear. That's why I thought it was OK. No, I didn't see Mom do it. I didn't see Mom do it. I said, Mom, should I set the cruise control at 80 all the way home? She's like, that's fine. And if she says anything different, it's a lie. Because you don't ever test my memory. My memory is perfect. <laughs> so uh, maybe we can trust questionnaires. Um, <laughs> in any case, I think I present this sample mostly to show that, that um, to convey what, what I also find when, when, we wear the, when I wear the ear by myself, that over a certain period of time, people habituate to wearing the ear. And they, they broadly, over stretches of time, forget about wearing it, and tend to talk pretty naturally. So the, 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 you hear it from the voice. Um, there may be things that are censored, and, and we're perfectly fine with things being censored because we don't want to get intruded into people's private lives. Um, but what we do want is a most accurate picture of those aspects of daily life that participants um, feel willing to share. The third one is my favorite one, and it's kind of also nice in this afternoon to make us feel all relaxed. Artistic life. <laughs> If you only knew how easy iPhone's out. <laughs> so I present this sound file because I think it's a particularly good example of singing. Um, but I also present this sound file because it reminds me uh, to tell you that the way we, we, we handle ear research, because there's obviously privacy considerations and so on, is that we provide participants with an opportunity to delete any sound file that they do not want to be shared with the researchers. The way we do it is that we say, we don't touch the sound files until you're entirely done with the study, until you're debriefed, until you um, have received compensation in your entirely other study. You have an opportunity to listen to the sound files, and you tell us which sound files do you want to have deleted. I think that's very important because, again, we only want to obtain the information that participants feel comfortable sharing with us. We um, want to have, and we have to have the participants on our side. We have to um, engage them in the research to get good compliance. And, and for that, we, need to, we want the most accurate picture of what um, you're doing on a daily basis. That's our purpose. So um, we only want what you feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Just clarification. And what about, um, um, what about other people that are being recorded on this. I mean, how do you get through IRB in terms of, yeah. you know, like in that one conversation, apparently the father or yeah. a relative? I mean, that is, that, is, that is a very good question. And, and we have a series of safeguards that, that prevents that. Most importantly, um, that A, it's anonymous in the sense that um, you, you, there's no name or any per personal identifying information captured to the extent that they're aware. Personally identifying information captured, we delete that. We delete anything where we capture names or anything like that. Um, and the other part is that we tell participants to readily introduce it to, to, to bystanders, to other people around them. So we tell, we tell them, please tell participants that there is a chance of them being recorded. And the way we maximize that is that we now use um, an alert triangle, an alert sign. So we have an orange alert sign with a microphone on there. And so participants that talk to, or if bystanders talk to our participants, um, they readily see and, and, and they tend to ask. And we pilot tested that. It was very salient. And that's one of the ways. We also have certificates of confidentiality, and NIH certificates of confidentiality, that we don't have to give out the data and so on. But that's some of the protections. OK, um, so oh yeah, the singing. So, so what, what happened was that um, we give partic participants the opportunity to delete sound files. And of course, no questions asked. But in one case, the participants um, told us, well, I, I, I deleted a sound file. And it was me singing because I was so embarrassed that, that you would hear me singing. Um, in general, very few participants delete um, sound files. But it's important to have that. Um, how much do people mind wearing the ear in daily life? How obtrusive is the method in daily life? We have questionnaires. We ask people, how much do you change your behavior and things like that. But because we're notoriously skeptical of self-report, we wanted to come up with an unobtrusive measure of obtrusiveness. 
So the way we do that is that we code how often people talk about the ear in their conversations. And when you do that, you see a really nice um, curve that at the beginning, initially, they, they talk about it a lot. And after a few hours, um, um, things drop below 1% of conversation. So this corresponds very well to what participants tell us in debriefing interviews. And it corresponds very well to my own experience that the first few hours, you're, you're very um, aware that you're wearing a device that potentially records. And after that, well, life continues, and life is fast paced, and life is busy, and, and we, we, we largely forget about it over long stretches of time. So we have a methodology that um, participants tolerate, and we also have data on compliance. We, we can track compliance as well, and that produces, um, or that, that is mo only moderately obtrusive in, in daily life. Um, why would one want to use the ear for studying character? Um, well, uh, as I said, initially at the talk, most research on stability of behavior is based on self-report, um, mostly on global self-report, in part on, on momentary self-report. And obviously, this research has tremendous validity, but I think it can be nicely complemented with um, an observational perspective, where an observational perspective can better control social desirability effects. So we, we all want to be virtuous. Um, so therefore, we probably this is the domain where you have fairly strong social desirability effects. Um, and, and so an observational approach can guard to some extent against that. Only to some extent because it still has a social de desirability of, of expressing virtuous behavior, that, but that's a different story. We can talk about that. Um, also, um, the, the representative sampling across the full range of a person's day, um, from the full ecology, so to say, of a person's daily situations facilitates generalizability. So Brunswick talked about that um, with respect to representative design, that we, we seem to um, have um, committed a, a, a fallen prey to a double standard, that we sample participants from, from populations, and that's where we apply sampling theory, but we don't really sample situations from, from the broader ecology of, so we have two random factors, participants and situations, and so um, doing, uh, sampling these sound bites um, can, can help with that. Um, th the third point is probably controversial, but, but I think I'll just take a stance here um, and, and um, it's very consistent with what Kenneth Craig said, that, that ultimately lives are lived day by day, day in, day out, day after day. Lives as we live and experience them are inherently quotidian. So I'm focusing, we're focusing in this project um, primarily on ordinary daily virtuous behavior. So those are not the big things in life. This is not that you feel empathy and you jump into the river after your kid. This is, this is the little things in life, the little um, nicenesses and, and, and virtues. Um, that we can capture with the audience daily life. Um, so in somewhat a, a complementary approach to some of the other things that, that we've seen presented. And finally, and I think this is, this is a methodological point, but also an interesting point, I think, that it allows for the emergence of stability from, in two ways, from how individuals act in, behave in certain situations, interact with situations, but also stability from how individuals select themselves into certain situations. So, you, so what, what Harshorn and May did, they put kids in a certain context. That how do you act in this context? On the other hand, people also differ in the way they select situations in the first place. And, and so we can capture that um, with this daily life methodology. The specific aims, we had four specific aims. I'm, I'm only going to talk about the second today. So the first one is really um, looking at convergence across methods, naturalistic observation, self-report, and peer report. Um, the other one is about the stability of naturalistically observed virtuous daily behavior relative to the stability of neutral or evaluatively negative behavior. And uh, we will also look at within-person variability, um, the way Will Fleeson has done it. and um, look for possibility of change. We have one sample in there is a, is a meditation study, a compassion meditation study, which is, I guess, intended to make people more virtuous, at least in the communal domain. And so we can test whether um, um, compassion meditation changes virtuous behavior more so than, well, presumably neutral behavior. All right, um, how about theoretical predictions about stability of virtuous behavior? Um, that's, I think, where, where um, we've heard so much, and in some ways, we already have a pretty good idea of how stable behavior is. Um, we have a pretty good idea from the presentations here. We have a pretty good idea from the literature. Um, so this is taken from a meta-analysis that, that Brent Roberts and Delecchio did a while ago. Um, the meta-analysis is much more sophisticated. It talks about um, age effects. It talks about um, length between assessment effects. But this is controlling for the, le uh, the length of assessment, looking at um, the different methods, and you, you find stability from observational assessment um, 
the, the stability coefficient is 0.48. So just to give us a, a, guide, a guideline, a, um, um, a, um, yeah, a reference for, for what, we, what we might expect. The other question, and in some way the more interesting question then is, how about differential stability? Um, so on the one hand, we have virtuous um, daily behaviors such as gratitude, affection, hope. Um, and we have neutral daily, daily behaviors. And, and, and there, I, I guess we just need to look for the most neutral behaviors that we can find. And so I was looking at maybe just the way people use numbers or long words, something that, that's very trivial. And from a differential stability standpoint, the question is, well, to the extent that virtuous daily behavior is particularly um, afforded by the situation, or to the extent that there's very strong normative forces that act on virtuous behavior and act more so on virtuous behavior than on the question of whether you use long words, articles, and so on, um, you would expect that virtuous behavior um, shows lower levels of stability than, than um, neutral behavior. On the other hand, you can make the reverse argument and you can say, well, to the extent that um, virtuous behavior is very important for people, it's part of the core um, um, the power of the person's self, core self-concept is very salient to person as a guideline for behavior. Therefore, um, it should be more, um, more on, on the person's forefront to bring the person in line with the self-concept. And that would lead to stronger consistency. So you could say, well, maybe virtuous behavior emerges as, um, as more reliable and more, more stable than, than neutral behavior. And of course, we also have the possibility that um, both types of behavior are ultimately um, produced by similar underlying mechanisms, and, and then we would um, find um, relatively comparable levels of stability. We also wanted to know how, this is a bit dicey because I guess I'm not sure, I mean, you, you, in fact, the study on cheating behavior by Hartshorn and May was, was framed as a virtue, um, so, so therefore we wanted to look at evaluatively negative daily behaviors such as blame, blaming, complaining, and bragging. And the question then is how, how does that, how is the stability from neutral to negative or do we find essentially what is evaluativeness effect or social desirability effect is one more than the other. So we look at the stability of, of those three types of behavior. What was our database of studies? We used um, um, studies that were suited to answer the question of ear studies that we had previously collected. So we had um, four samples for this study. One is, um, a study of, of healthy adults in, um, the, in, the, in the larger Atlanta area. That's the meditation study. It's actually a study that's, that's still in progress. And here we had a sampling rate of 50 seconds every nine minutes. Um, and we had um, two weekends, eight weeks apart. So we had an ear monitoring at time one. There was a meditation intervention in, in, in between, and then an, another ear, ear weekend um, eight weeks later. The sec second sample is a, sa a study on, on um, coping with rheumatoid arthritis. We had 50 seconds every 18 minutes, um, two weeks apart, uh, two weekends, four weeks apart. So we have one eight weeks retest reliability, one four weeks re retest reliability, and then we had a, a study on couples coping with breast cancer. So we have 50, uh, two breast cancer patients and their partners. That's a study that we just completed um, very recently. It, it went over five years, and. Um, we, we recorded 50 seconds every nine minutes for one week, and then here we can look at um, odd even day stability. So the degree to which um, recording one, three, five, seven um, corresponds with recording two, four, six, eight. So essentially stability at the, at the micro level from, from moment to moment. So we have about 190 participants, um, and these are more than 25,000 real world situations. So this is um, the, the little things in life that people actually did in their daily behaviors. A um, little bit about around the methods. So all of the sound files were triple coded. Um, that sounds like a lot of work, but it, it, made, it may sound excessive to some, but the truth is that we used to, co to code things like talking on the phone, and, and you, you may only need one coder, and maybe you want to double code, but now we're getting to, more, more, um, to broader constructs, and so we, we felt like we needed more coders. So we have everything triple coded. Uh, we um, decided to go with a binary coding strategy. Behavior is present, affection is present versus absent. There can also be, you can make an argument for why ratings are psychometrically uh, superior. Um, the, the one advantage that this allows us to do, it allows us to give estimates of the base rate of these virtuous behaviors in daily life. Um, another decision that we did is we looked at, at um, virtues only in social interactions. So. Um, 
we, d we decided that the virtues we measured would, is, would by, by methodological constraint, but also by theoretical um, constraint, they would mostly show up when people interacting. So if you, if you um, well, we can't get at the experience of gratitude, just at the expressions of gratitude, but, but you, may, um, you may say thank you to yourself. Uh, without anybody there, we would not look at that. We only look at virtues in interactions. So the variables, because we have binary codings, interactions, and we aggregate across them, so we have the variables expressed as the percentage of interactions where any given behavior was present. Um, in sample one and two, we have test three test reliability, stability over one month and two months. And in sample three, we have odd even correlations with stability within one weekend, um, essentially every other sound file. And today, we have the, the results, obviously, for each study. But we, um, for the sake of presentation, I'm going to pool them across all four samples. So these are the categories that, that, that we focused on, that, that we coded. So um, with respect to the, the, the virtues, um, daily behavior, we coded expressing gratitude, showing affection, offering praise, making compliments, apologizing, expressing um, hope, showing optimism, and showing sympathy, empathy, and concern. So here are some examples. And these are actual examples. So these are just adapted to make them fit on one slide. But these are things that, that did occur and that we did code. So showing gratitude, for example, thank you so much. I really appreciate you helped me a lot. Showing affection, I love you, I really do. Offering praise, you're learning, you're learning a lot, you're doing great. Um, apologize. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you look bad. Um, you can you can read them. Um, the negative behaviors that we focused on was blaming, being sarcastic, being condescending or arrogant, complaining, whining, criticizing, bragging. Um, as part of the grant, we we narrowed down um, the behaviors. We had a broader list of behaviors, but we needed to focus on those that we most likely could code reliably. So those were the ones that that were um, most easily quotable from, from the ambient sound. So blaming, I came to see you, you were gone, you maybe wait an hour, being sarcastic. You want lemonade? Sure, after you drank the whole thing, um, being condescending, arrogant. How did you get so retarded? Oh yes, I know what it means. Um, complaining, whining, you make it so difficult. Um, criticizing, <laughs> then you, <laughs> I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> um, bragging, my dad's car collection is so large, he had to build a new garage. So you see this, I mean, again, these are, these are little things. They happen on a daily basis. That's why we call them virtuous daily behaviors. It's not virtuous behavior more generally, it's just the ones that really happen more or less on a daily basis. Um, so these are the results. Um, this is um, the big results of our, of our, our study, that how, it, how it came together. I should say that we're still analyzing the data, we're still um, um, looking at it, but, but this is kind of the first picture. This is the base rate and variability. In some level, uh, on some, in many cases, it's not really worth focusing much on the descriptives and base rate and stability, uh, base rate and variability. But in our case, so those really are base rates in the sense this is the percentage of interactions in which the person showed this. So we have, um, and they're, they're ordered by frequency. So we call it empathy in, in about 6% of the person's um, interaction. Affection was ex expressed in about 4%. And there's large variability around. The variability is, is in almost all cases as large as, as the mean. We have a, a gratitude expressed in three cases, apologizing um, a lot less. And what you see is that, um, what you see is that the base rate of, of the negative daily behaviors is substantially lower than the base rate of the positive um, behaviors. Not for whining and complaining, we, show, I mean, we find that quite a bit. Um, and, and criticizing, we also do find quite a bit, but at least for those behaviors. Um, well, that could have different sources. Um, that it could have the source that people censor particularly negative behaviors. We find little evidence of that. And, and the fact that, um, that, that other researchers have found in experience sampling research that positive behavior tends to be more frequent than negative behavior makes us um, believe that this, is, this is a, that this is probably a true reflection. It's just that social norms obviously um, afford more the expression of positive behaviors than negative behaviors. Uh, the, the important point is that from a methodological standpoint, the base rate differences um, exert constraints on, on what falls down the road. Ex ooh, ooh. Exert constraints on, on reliability. And so um, we did our best job in coding those. Those are triple codings. Um, so we get pretty decent, actually quite, quite good reliability for the positive behaviors. Um, we were 
good in some of the negative, and I guess by some standards those would, those would count as passable. By some other standards, um, they, they're, they're only moderately high dose reliability. And again, um, this is after extensive training. This is with three coders. Um, and we, as you will see, reliability is strongly determined by, by base rate. In other cases, if you have just very few instances that, and you miss one, I think you, you constrain the reliability. Um, stability, well, um, in line with what other people, have, other research have reported at the conference and in line with, with, with what other research has found, we find substantial stability. Um, so empathy, for example, the degree to which you, you show empathy at time one um, correlates 0.60 with empathy at time two. Um, in, many, in many ways, those, those correlations probably at, at the end of the conference are not, not really um, throwing you off the seat anymore. And, and, and I can understand that. On the other hand, I think what we need to understand is these are the, the tiny little thank you you say after somebody offers you something, or the tiny little um, praise or the praise and the compliments you give to your kids, or the affection you show to your partner or to other people. So those are not, they are free of a person's self-concept. They are free of anything, any um, mechanism that would act on stability um, in the context of a person's self-concept. Self They're also free of, for example, um, social desirability as, um, at least from the perspective of the rater. Again, they're not free of social desirability in the context of expressing, and, and that's why we find those um, base weight differences. Um, interestingly, we did not find a difference in the average stability between um, positive behaviors and negative behaviors. So the average stability is, that's what I said the answer to the talk would be 0.40, is 0.44 and um, 0.42 for the negative ones. You can then analyze to what extent um, variability plays a role in this, and variability was a very strong determinant of reliability. That, is, um, that makes a lot of sense that, that you need variability to code, to code reliably. We also find that variability was a very strong determinant of stability. All that makes you feel like psychometric theory is OK, um, doing well. And interestingly, reliability then had only a, a mild relationship on stability. Um, so, so we can, we, uh, we can, for example, compare the two. How about the comparison of those positive, or the, the virtuous daily behavior, the negative behaviors, to neutral behaviors? Well, um, so as I said, the virtuous daily behaviors are derived from social interactions. So to just quickly go back, so we, it's possible, I guess, we, we were thinking that somebody expressed gratitude just by him or herself, and we did not count. But all the other ones, showing empathy, affection, praise, to, to us made sense that we constrain it only to those cases where, where it happens in, in social interaction. So they're definitely biased towards communal um, virtues. So um, we needed a neutral behavior that happens in social interactions and that, that we had already coded from the sound files and that we can compare it to. So what, what I decided to focus on was neutral interaction behavior um, as um, measured by a person's word choice. And, and the way we've done it is by using it, an automatic text analysis tool, linguistic inquiry and word count that um, goes through text looks, text, looks word by word and classifies that into different uh, linguistic categories. So for example, I am happy would be I first person singular, am present tense verb, happy um, positive emotion words. So here's the stability of our virtuous behavior, and here's the stability of our negative behavior. So for those of you who know this text analysis software, it has 80 categories to choose from. Um, so you have, have quite some, some um, degrees of freedom in that. So I, I, and there's many categories that, that are psychologically relevant and therefore not neutrals. For example, positive emotion words, negative emotion words, swear words, and so on. So to, to increase the confidence in these findings, I looked at those language behaviors that could be post hoc classified into maybe one or the other. So, so here, for example, these are categories um, from the linguistic inquiry and word count. Sadness words, the degree to which a person used sadness words, anger words, swear words, or filler words. And we see that, um, that those, the stability coefficients for those variables tend to map quite nicely onto the stability coefficient of the negative behaviors. Um, I looked at um, Luke variables that could broadly be classified as tapping into word use related to virtues, sorry, the degree to which somebody used achievement words, family words, friend words, or um, the communal pronoun we, us, our, so showing a communal orientation, and we find, again, a stability coefficients that, that seem to bolster the average stability here. Um, I also looked at I, me, and my, because I look a lot 
at that variable in my own research. And I mean my is an interesting word because, well, it's an interesting word in many ways, but in this case, in the context of virtues, you could say it could go either way. It could be here because I has been, uh, the f use of first person singular has been found to be an indicator of honesty and telling the truth, so that would be a virtue. On the other hand, people also tend to think that um, use of first person singular, I, 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 um, goes with narcissism, so then it would actually fall more here. In any case, the stability is, is roughly in line with what we found there. OK, so how about our neutral behaviors? Um, well, we chose grammatical categories that we thought were truly just not positively or negatively connotative, prepositions, adverbs, references to space, time, articles, and numbers. And what you see is um, that the stability is, is highly comparable to what we found um, with the, the, the virtuous behavior and the negative behavior. So we have, again, a stability of about um, 0.40. To the extent that the selection of those may appear slightly arbitrary, here, here are some other ones that I could have chosen, and, and it really comes out pretty much the same way. All right, um, summary and conclusion. The ear method naturalistic observation can be used to study virtuous behavior in everyday life, mostly the little things in life, um, the virtues that we, that we um, engage in, that we express on a daily basis. Um, Naturalistically observed virtuous daily behavior shows substantial temporal stability. The degree is comparable to what we um, know from other research. Um, these levels of stability are consistent with the temporal stability that past research has shown um, for observed traits and behaviors more generally. And most interestingly, and that's where I would also really like to get some feedback from the philosophers, um, we found comparable levels of stability. On some level, that's maybe not too surprising if you think that the, what, what guides and um, the mechanisms underlying may not be very different. Um, but you could also make an argument why they should have been um, different. Uh, limitations is, well, I consider an advantage, but it's also a disadvantage. We really looked only at the ordinary, everyday virtuous behavior. Um, we only looked, at, in particular in the context of, of uh, Christian's talk, we only looked at the behavioral expression of the underlying virtue, um, not well, both not the experience of the virtue, but also not the underlying dispositions in some ways. Um, and ultimately, we could only code what was acoustically um, available to us, so we have a relatively narrow range of acoustically detectable virtuous behaviors. Um, so this is not at all it's out there, and by, by method, it's, it's obviously constrained in the direction of communal virtues. So um, for the conclusion from an observer's perspective, virtuous daily behavior is substantially character-like. Um, you find virtues in the little things in daily life. And um, as far as it looks now, as character-like, as um, neutral, more neutral, and, and negative behavior. So I want to thank the participants for sharing so readily the sounds of their personal daily lives. I want to thank all the, 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 the amazing team of researchers that coded the sound files. I want to thank Catherine Bollick, who, who helped with preparing and analyzing the data. And setting up ear data is really a lot of work. Um, the students in my lab and the funding agencies that funded the primary studies and of course Wake Forest University and the Templeton Foundation for the grant support. Thank you very much. So Matthias uh, has decided to uh, field his own questions so long as you don't get unruly, in which case uh, Nancy Snow is going to take care of you. <laughs> and I disagree with you that I, I even though it's late in the conference, I, I, I did nearly fall off my chair at your correlations. I, I, thought they were, I thought they were really high and impressive. And I think given, given that you're using uh, you know, sound recordings, there's no visual, you know, there's no observation of what people are doing sound recordings. You're having independent people code them, right? You have no, you know, no stake in how virtuous this person comes out. Given the restrictive range of behaviors that you can measure using virtue, to get correlations around 0.6 or 0.7 is just stunning. Um, so I, I think that's amazing, given all that. And then, but I will disagree with your averaging technique and your conclusion. I think it makes. I, I think it's really. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can agree with averaging across behaviors at a five percent. Oh. base rate with ones that have a 1% base rate. And when you don't do that, yeah. you find that, in fact, 
the virtuous behaviors are actually more stable than the neutral behaviors. If you limit it to things that have base rates, say, above 1% or 2%, which I, I just can't really, you can't really Sorry. expect stability with a base rate below 1% yeah. or 2%. What I, for, what I, I don't know how I could forget to say that. That is, for the, for particularly for a positive and negative, I think, we did match, uh, how could I forget? We did okay. match the, the neutral behaviors. We matched them in base rate. Um, to the, the, the positive and negative. It's still, you're still right in the sense that the, part, the, the virtuous behaviors had a higher base rate than the negative ones. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 even, and, and, and I still would, I would look at those data and say, I would say 0.6 or 0.7 is really a, a characterization. My guess is that if you could get you know, enough sound bites of those low base rate behaviors, you, those correlations would also go up to 0.6 or 0.7. It's just when you have low base rate correlations, of, you can't tell. And we had low reliability for those as yeah. well. So that would then suggest that, I guess that could possibly suggest that the true, the true stability is actually higher for negative behaviors than it is possible, right? That's interesting, yeah. Um, yeah. If, if that was, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes? Uh, thanks, Ruth. This is so interesting. So I have a picture of my own understanding of the virtues. They seem to be a little bit uh, able to be identified more contextually than you seem to. So I was kind of trying to look at all the lists you know, you can see where I'm going, where I could think, oh, blaming could be very virtuous. You blame someone when they do something wrong to help improve them, or you blame a child, and or generous. Hey, take my sister's TV. You know, it's something that's not yours. And for each one of them, I think I could really say that it doesn't map onto my understanding of virtue. So I wonder, do you mean virtue in a kind of normative sense? Or are you using it in a more neutral sense that I have in mind? And then I'll, I guess also just for my own interest, do you see any prospects for getting to a more normatively robust understanding of virtue and be and seeing using this the, this yeah. technology to to evidence that a little more? Well, th that is a very good question. So the, the context of that, um, I guess what we what we simply cannot get at. What on the other hand, for example, the experience sampling researchers can get at is the intention underlying the behavior. So whether I just say thank you to the person because I actually want to get something out of the person, or whether you say you blame the person in order to, to promote um, behavior change. So the intention underlying the behavior is inaccessible to, this, to the observational method. The context, some of the context, I would argue, is considered by the coders. So the coders listen to the entire 50 seconds, and 50 seconds is actually a, lo a, a long time. So um, if, they, if they determine that as, um, gratitude, then the context ought to be ideally taken into account. But it's true that, that I think uh, we really focused on, because we needed to get reliability, we focused on behaviors almost from the lay person's definition, that these are people that everybody consensually would um, identify as blaming, as criticizing, and so on. Just a brief follow up on it. I have no problem with them characterizing it as generosity, just that generosity, so as it's being coded as a virtue, is a normatively important notion rather than just a descriptively descriptive notion of people giving, rather than like a, a virtue, something to strive to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which would the intention, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I jump yeah. in? So I think that, to some extent, is something that psychologists aren't in a position to do at all, and in are including our coders. So even if they could get at the whole context, the sense of the whole episode, and so on, I'm not sure. I think that's a job for philosophers. Say, is this particular instance of generosity a virtuous one or not? And I'm not sure if philosophers would agree. And uh, maybe giving away your sister's TV is really generous. Um, so I, I don't know that we could ever address that. Yeah, that's kind of what I wondered. Yeah. It's the same thing that Ian uh, was pointing out. Um, so the two limitations, one about the motivation behind the behavior, and then the other um, about the contextual features, which might make an evalu difference in the normative evaluation of the action. So something could be rated as um, a, a, a gracious behavior, um, but if we knew all the facts, we'd realize that it's actually um, not a gracious behavior. So I think I would want to couch it a little differently um, in terms of seemingly virtuous behavior. And so uh, in, a, in a slide, or apparently virtuous behavior, in the slides it was always virtuous behavior. Um, I could live with as apparently. As an ethicist or I could live with apparently virtuous behavior. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so I think I have a great first comment because I'm also going to sort of comment on that. Okay. But just the idea of um, whether the same, the people who are the, the virtuous ones are the same ones who are also the not virtuous ones? Like, are they correlated? 
Because that would get at, you know, whether it's just sort of um, very socially active people, maybe, who are just engaging in the good and the bad more. Okay, so, so we control for the number of social interactions. So, it's, it's so that's why they're relative, so it's percentage of total social interactions. So if somebody has more social interactions, the person will, may have more raw counts, but not the percentage of interactions. So that is, the, the overall social activity is controlled for. Um, correlations. Like across, like for example, the people who are being coded as um, more empathic, mm -hmm. are they also the liners? Empathic you know, liners. Yeah, but I, like, think I think we assume when we listen to this that there's these two separate yeah. clusters of people, but I'm not so sure unless I see no. so how they work together. I've looked at the correlations. They, they tend to be not particularly high, um, but that's just because we, we observe these micro behaviors. So I believe that, um, for example, is it um, whining? So were, you mean the neg negative correlations? I, I think they were roughly uncorrelated, but that's something we have to look more, more into. Thank you. John? I think you guys are being a little too concessive. Maybe this means I'm not really a philosopher, but I wonder how many mysteries of this kind there. Thanks so much for lending that to me. Now, you know, well, we don't really know all the motives. It seems like a lot of these have pretty good face value, right, for these kinds of these kinds of simple, especially when they're low cost behaviors to the individual. You know, so of course there are the philosophical case. I saved the drowning child to torture him later, right? But it doesn't seem like these kinds of day-to-day uh, um, -day activities that there's a huge risk of those kinds of features that people are going around wearing a mask of civility, right? Um, that, that's, so so I, I, I'm, I'm not persuaded um, that with 50 second samples, I would guess that people would be pretty good at, 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 at attributing the right sort of backing mental states. That would be my, my, my guess. It's quite a lot of information. That's sometimes surprising. Like, thin slice research uses 30 seconds, and that already gets, a, like, well, since slice in psychology is, is a field of psychology where you have very little information be showing that it can actually predict a lot. And so 30 seconds tend to predict a lot, even like teaching evaluations at the end of the course and things like that. So we have 50. It is actually quite a lot of information that is true. And just, just to be a little concessive on Christian's point, though, right, of course, if you think that attribution of virtue requires robust, long-standing dispositions, that kind of stuff, of course, can't read that off mm -hmm. this. But it seems like the type of conduct and proximate motivations might not be all that mysterious. So point taken about, about uh, um, putative robust dispositions. Yeah, well, sorry, uh, I've already <laughs> spoken, but um, I mean, so there are two things. One, is the motivation okay? And two, does the person get it right? So um, the person's motivation could be quite good, um, but the person just misses some important facts about the situation. So the person have, might have a good heart, mm -hmm. and we can read that off, um, but just misses some things in the situation. So two things have to be yeah. checked here that aren't, we're not gonna have real good access to. One is the underlying motivation, and two, the surrounding facts in the environment, which make a difference to the evaluation of the action. So the person is a really good person, very grateful person, but just misses the opportunity to say thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So my, my question is uh, sort of related. Uh, I'm somewhat less worried about context and, and how uh, that might have an influence on the evaluation of behavior. But I'm thinking about how much of the variance might just be possible to explain by appealing to habits. So if I think about my own case, I'm so accustomed to say um, thank you or somehow reciprocate whatever the other person has said that I would say it even when it's completely inappropriate, let's say, of, you know, somebody says, have a good flight, and I say, you too. Uh, and the person is, you no, know, she's not going anywhere. She's just the person working at the airport. And, or sometimes somebody says, you know, happy birthday, and I say, you too. Well, I don't know. <laughs> um, which sort of suggests to me that, you know, much of what might seem like. This politeness behavior, for it's, example. Yeah, it's just. Can be, can be explained at what I take to be a sort of lower level yeah. of habits. Well, so, so yes, I guess I guess in t because of the way we code the virtues, possible. I mean, we tap into a good amount of politeness behavior, but politeness behavior, I think, in some way, could also be considered a virtue, right? And the other part to it, I think, about the habit, what kind of mechanism produces the stability? I would say the fact that we found comparable stability of of trivial, well, tr 
Penny Baker would not argue trivial, of trivial language categories and, and the virtuous behavior would suggest that to a large extent there, there is habit involved in those. So a habit is probably one mechanism driving it. Had we found very high stability for virtuous behavior and much higher than for, um, for these neutral categories, then, then habit would not have the same. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it with the negative behaviors, it seems like it being a habit isn't, uh, doesn't excuse it away, right? So yeah, I, I was whining, but I was only whining because it's my habit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say to some extent it does. I mean, I, I actually do take it differently in people who, you know, I know it's not against me or something. It just, that's, that's kind of how they are, you know. So, yeah, I, I do make decisions to have it. <laughs> so, Matias, just one second. So, we have a little wiggle room here because the bar doesn't open. 25 uh, Oh my god. We also, we also have the invitation to So let's do two more questions. And then I thought the last question raises an interesting uh, question I wonder about. It sounds like you can't answer with your data, but I wonder if there are data that, that do get at this question. Uh, I wonder if there would be a correlation between simply having the habit of being polite or kind to other people and engaging in more intensely virtuous behaviors. Like, so we're making the argument that they're completely separate things, but maybe they're not completely separate. People who have the habit of, yeah, thinking of the other person's feelings, a little, even a little bit, and thinking it'll make them happier if I say thank you than if I don't. So you say thank so you. So controlling for agreeableness with that, and food, I mean, in some way, it's removing. Some of it's removing. I mean, agreeableness is not entirely. I mean, just a, an automatic process, right? I'm just thinking yeah. if you, in your study, assessed yeah. some more intensely virtuous behaviors. Oh, would I see. the mm -hmm. enactment yeah. of everyday virtuous behaviors be correlated with enacting more intense? So we look at controllability and automaticity as a dimension, actually. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah.